Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, my goal for today is to do just a little bit of recap from yesterday. And then um, our goal is, so let, let me see this. So goals for today. So one, do a little bit of recap. Two, uh, we're going to uh, show that the dual a dual, which you, if you remember, is defined to be take the Picard scheme associated to A, you know, with respect to its identity element, and take the connected component of the identity and the scheme structure on that. <clears throat> we want to show that this is an abelian variety. And then third, um, we want to get started with isogeny and torsion. And I don't think that we'll get to the proof of weak mortal day today, so that will be the focus of tomorrow. But yeah, this is a, a rough uh, overview of what we're doing today, so let's start with some recap. Oh, my macros have gotten screwed up. That's okay, we'll just scroll, it's not a big deal. All right, so, right. Um, cool. <clears throat> so recall from yesterday that if L is a line bundle on A, or A is in villain variety, then it induced a map phi sub L from A to the card scheme, which I will just write this way. And it's defined on T points. <laughs> which if you recall the, the T points of this guy, we identified with, give me the rigidified line bundles on T, or, or rather, <laughs> With respect to T, uh, so need to submit themselves. Okay, mod isomorphism, right? So what did it do? Well, it sent a T point of A to what? Well, what we do is we look at translation by X, which remember is a map from A sub T to A sub T. We pull back by that. Um, and what do we pull back? Well, we pull back the, um, the line bundle L sub A sub T, which if you remember, A sub T projects onto A, and we're pulling back by that projection. So then we tensor this guy um, with the inverse. And so then the theorem of the square which I guess this should be capitalized, that's okay. Theorem of the square says um, phi L is a group scheme morphism. Hold on a second, I think. I think somebody needs to mute it. There shouldn't be anyone that needs to be admitted. Okay. I hear like random typing noises and like chuckles. <laughs> Maybe I'm just going insane. That's possible. No, too. it's it's my microphone being being out loud. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay. So all right. Just a second. Having minor technical problems. Okay. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Ooh, that's not good. All of my macros have been screwed up. Let's see, how do I fix that? Mm. Okay, guys, hold on a second. Technical difficulties. Yesterday, but didn't prove. So claim is that phi L factors through um, a dual. And again, you can check the notes for a proof of that. Um, note that this, this approach can actually be used. So this statement here can actually be used to define the dual um, in a nice way. And I, I'll try to post some explicit references to that in the Slack um, where I, you know, I, I identified the you know, precise passage. But uh, if you want a reference for where that stuff is done, then look at either um, Ben Moonen. He has some notes on abelian varieties. Just look up Ben Moonen abelian varieties. And also, um, if you look up Bhargav Bhatt, he also has some notes on abelian varieties. And they construct the dual as a sort of group scheme quotient. And they, they think about phi sub L and its kernel because it is, again, a group scheme morphism. So it has a, a scheme theoretic kernel. OK. So um, a proposition which will follow from things we do today, but I think I won't get to the proof of, is that, in fact, we can describe, uh, we can describe the k-bar points of A using phi sub L. So this alludes to what I was just talking about, um, which is that can identify the k-bar points of a dual as the isomorphism classes living in the Picard group on a base change to k-bar, which remember, we can identify this guy with, um, oh gosh, what, what are we doing here? Well, so this, this is basically us thinking of the Picard scheme and its k-bar points. So that's, that's where this is coming from. And it's precisely the line bundles, or the isomorphism classes of line bundles, such that phi sub L vanishes. So this is a useful thing to know. And, and this also hints at the group scheme quotient approach, where we're saying, OK, well, look at the kernel of this thing and use that to cut out the dual. OK, so cool. Hopefully, this gives a little bit more context on how this stuff works. Um, yeah, All right, so I'll keep the proposition up. Okay, so something that I didn't say yesterday that is very important, but I don't want to spend too much time on is that, um, you know, if, if A is an abelian variety over K, then A is projective. So I think what I want to do here is basically just sketch the proof um, and leave the details to later, uh, because this is something that will be very important. You know, I mean, the, the projectivity of A is you know very closely tied to the existence of an ample line bundle, and it will turn out that having an ample line bundle on A is precisely what we need to actually wrap up the proof of mortal A um, at the end of this course. So, yeah. So let me just give you a sketch. So proof uh, sketch. OK. <clears throat> so again, the goal here is to produce an ample line bundle on A. OK, so we do this in a series of steps. So here, here are the steps, roughly speaking. So you first use Galois descent to reduce to the case k is k bar. This is a pretty routine thing to do. Um, 
I, I think you shouldn't, you shouldn't have too much trouble working out by hand. If you've never worked with Galois Descent, then you should definitely check out Brian Conrad's notes, which, which I um, have laid out in my notes, because uh, he does a good job of explaining how that works. Okay, but we, we won't need to know the details here. All right, so we, re we first reduced the case where we, where we have a um, algebraically closed base field. Okay, so then here's what we do. So we let u be, I guess, a connected open neighborhood of the identity. It's not an n. Open neighborhood of e in a. Okay. So then uh, one shows that, I guess I'll, I'll put it here for consistency. So the divisor D, which is given by taking the complement of U in A and reducing it, is an effective V divisor. Okay. Three. So basically, um, what what this result rests on is, you know, we want to know uh, what it takes for an ample line bundle for a line bundle to be ample. So there are a couple of equivalent conditions that are laid out. One of those equivalent conditions is right here. So um, look at the set of k points of A, which remember that we're assuming that k is algebraically closed. If, if k is not algebraically closed, you could not do this. You'd have to talk about k bar. Um, basically translating D or pulling back D by translation gives you D itself. So this set right here, you want to show that, well, it's a small that, I'm sorry about that. Show this set is finite. So what you might expect if your line bundle is ample is that um, it has a high amount of symmetry. And so, you know, it, it makes sense to pull back by, well, one of our underlying symmetries of our line bundle, which is translation by some point. Um, and so, you know, you can show that ampleness is equivalent to having the pullback by translation of L be isomorphic to L. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess, I guess you have to know what L is, right? So, so maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So where is L? Well, one, one way that you could get a line bundle, right, is you need a divisor. And then you can twist your structure sheet by that divisor. So here, here what we do is we, we, in fact, come up with the divisor first. And then we say to ourselves, OK, look at the line bundle associated and then prove that that line bundle is ample. OK. So, one condition that, that you can check if you have a line bundle coming from a divisor is that pulling back by translation should give you something isomorphic. And then it turns out on the divisor level, you get straight up equality in this case. Hopefully, hopefully that's clear. Um, so you show that's finite. And then the fourth step is now that you have your divisor and, and you know that it's got some good behavior, you write down your line bundle. So you say, all right, it's going to be OA twisted by D. And from this, deduce that what? Well, that the second tensor power is globally generated, which means the same thing as, as generated by global sections, finite collection of them. And there's an associated embedding, I sub L, right, given by taking linearly independent sections find on A and embedding us into, well, the projective space over the global sections of the second tensor power of L. So this embedding map is finite. I guess I missed my is. Is. So show, show that this map is finite. Okay. And then once you know this, what you can do is say, OK, well, we know that the pullback of an ample line bundle by a finite morphism is also going to be ample. So 
basically this says that L tensor two, which is, well, none other than the pullback by the embedding associated to L of O of one, right? Where O of one here, I guess, is on this projective space. So maybe you can just put O of one here. Know that O of one is associated to this projective space. Okay. Um, this is ample. But then if some power of u is ample, or some positive power rather, uh, then u are ample as well. And that is what you want. Okay. And, and I guess, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the final step from this, once you have an ample line bundle, well, um, <clears throat> you can take some tensor power of it, it will be very ample, and that will define for you a projective embedding. So that, that gives you the result. Okay. Any any questions so far? Wait, is this is this map IL actually an embedding or just a finite map? Like a Um I, I don't think it's actually an embedding. So this is this may be a little disingenuous. Um Well actually no no so so um yeah, so let, let me think here. So we deduce that this map's globally generated. Sorry, this, this uh, line bundle is globally generated, right? And if you're globally generated, then you get a... Just a morphism. Just a morph yeah, yeah, you get just a morphism. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So you get the, the morphism. Yeah, you, you get a morphism, you show it's finite. Um, so th maybe this is a little disingenuous. Um, sorry about that, but yeah. All good. Okay, other questions? Okay, cool. So again, when I introduced abelian schemes and abelian varieties way back in lecture one, um, I said that projectivity is sometimes included as a hypothesis in the definition. So uh, it's, it's a little bit non-trivial that projectivity comes along from weaker hypotheses. And now we know that actually it's equivalent. Okay. so. Now that we know that, let's talk a bit about the dual as an abelian variety. So our goal here will be to prove this theorem, which is that a dual is an abelian variety. All right. So what does this boil down to, right? Well, a couple of things. Being an abelian variety is a, a multi condition definition. And so we want to check three different things. What are those things? Well, the first one is just some, some general conditions, which is that, um, so I should say here, a dual should be, and then in the first case, it should be uh, geometrically connected. K group scheme. Okay. Second is that it should be proper. Third, it should be smooth. Okay. So, well, basically, one comes for free because we already know that this, um, if I have a group scheme G and I look at G naught then G naught's a very well-behaved group scheme. Um, the geometrically connectedness comes along for the ride, as you can check the notes for. Um, so yeah, there, there's really nothing, nothing interesting going along in one. So what about two? So let's handle two. And since our guy a dual is defined essentially by a universal mapping property. It means that for the most part, we really understand only its functor of points. And so if we're going to deduce properness, we're going to need to use the valuative criterion. So our, our key tool is the valuative criterion of properness.
ugly criteria. That's okay. Okay, cool. So let me pan down here. <clears throat> okay, so how does this work, right? Well, first and foremost, thinking of the dual as pick zero a sub k, it sits inside of pick a sub k as a closed subscheme. So if we're going to deduce properness of this guy on the left, then we need only deduce properness of the guy on the right. So this closed situation implies that I uh, only need pick A over K proper card scheme. Okay. So how will we do that? Well, here's what. We know that the structure morphism, which I'll write as pick A over K to spec K is locally finite type. Well, in fact, we know better than that. It's, it's finite type. So it's finite type. Um, and so uh, we can check properness. So we can, we can check on, on DVRs, on discrete valuation rings, right? So then what we can do is, is look at the usual valuative criterion diagram, right? So what does that look like? Well, on the one hand, you have spec K and spec R, and there's a map this way. So I'll write down what these things are. So R here is a DVR and K is the fraction field of R. Okay, so then we assume that we have a map to the Picard scheme, which again maps by its structure morphism down to spec of K, like so. Okay, and then we assume that we have a compatible map like this. So we'll call this F. Okay. So we start off with a commutative diagram of this type. And what we want to know via the value of criterion is whether there's a unique lift. So our goal is to produce this morphism here, right? So then um, how do we do this? Well, remember that we understand something about what it means to map to the Picard scheme, right? So the data of, um, well, I guess, I guess I'll start with spec K. So the data of spec K mapping to the Picard scheme is equivalent to a line bundle line bundle L, well, maybe don't want to give you the name yet. Let me think. What name do I want to give it? Yeah, sure. So we have a long bundle L on A sub K, such that, or I guess not such that, but with a rigidification, right? Because remember that um, the points of the Picard scheme correspond to rigidified line bundles, right? So you give, I give you a line bundle on the base change, and I give you a rigidification of it. And that rigidification goes from you take L, you restrict it to the induced section E sub K, and you map that to the structure sheaf of spec K. Okay, so that's what this morphism is equivalent to data-wise. And um, the same holds true for any morphism of the form uh, spec R to the Picard scheme, right? So what we want to do is we need a line bundle M on 
shouldn't be a fancy A, it should be a normal one. Okay, so we need a line bundle on A sub R, or with a rigidification I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, with rigidification, let's say iota prime, which takes um, m, again restricted to this section, and then maps it isomorphically to what? Well, to the structure. Sorry, the structure sheaf of spec R, right? And it needs to be compatible. Compatible. with L and iota, right? Compatible in what sense? So remember that we want a commutative diagram like this. So we understand how to base change from R to K. And so then we, we want that basically pulling back by that, you know, pulling, pulling back by this morphism here should take the data associated to M and iota prime to the data associated to L and I. Okay. So we can rephrase this a little bit by doing the following. So just to simplify things, let's identify x with a sub r. OK. Then what we can do is let eta be the generic point. Yeah, that's fine. Generic point of R. And let's have L be a line bundle on the generic fiber of X. So Again, if we base change this guy, so, so the generic fiber in this case would be exactly a sub k. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, um, cool. Hold on. Wait, what am I doing? Hold on. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rephrasing essentially what it is that we're doing here, right? So the way that you should think about this problem is that we're really just trying to extend a line bundle defined on the generic fiber of a suitably nice scheme. So, so you could imagine, you know, relaxing some of the hypotheses on, on X, which is in a billion variety, right? Maybe, uh, maybe you only need that it's like geometrically connected and so on. And yeah, you want to prove an extension result. Okay. So basically, um, the claim is that L extends to all of X. And the rigidification sort of come along for the ride. So those are sort of swept under the rug a little bit, but um, you know, technically one does need to make sure that the rigidifications also match up. But that's, that's not too surprising because, um, well, because basically the, um, if L and M are related by extension, right, to where basically restricting one gives you the other, then this result on essentially extending this identity section will be automatic. Okay. So we want to do this and basically uh, this is just, so, so really this is just a statement about lifting uh, Cartier divisors.
on, let's say, projective integral k schemes, where k is, is the, the k algebra that it's also the, the fraction field of r. OK. So I, I don't want to go into too much more detail on this. Um, but what you should know is that this is a fairly straightforward result because you know, the, the Cartier divisor associated to L gives you some, some rather nice combinatorial data to play around with. Um, and then you can imagine like uh, taking all the associated neighborhoods of the Cartier divisor, like open neighborhoods, and beefing them up in the appropriate way. Uh, ask me for, for details later if you're still curious. OK, a any other questions? Um, was L a specific line bundle here? Or did you just pick any? Is L a specific line bundle here? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. So basically, the data of this morphism, so, so we're given a morphism from spec K, capital K being a, a K algebra, right? A little K algebra. My apologies on the multitude of Ks here. So the data of this map from spec K, or really the data of any uh, scheme mapping into the Picard scheme of A is that um, I produce for you a line bundle on A base change to whatever this guy is. So in this case, it's K, so I write A sub K. And it has some rigidification data where, remember, I know you weren't here yesterday, but if, if you had a chance to look at the lecture, then uh, the rigidification information is there to make sure that um, when we're parameterizing families of line bundles that we don't have to worry about automorphisms. So the rigidification is sort of a technical thing. Really what matters is this mediating line bundle. Um, so, so basically by the universal property of this guy, this map is equivalent to this line bundle plus a little extra data. It is, does that make sense? Yeah, and then the line bundle L that comes up in the like, later part is on this X sub eta. Is that the same? Object um, a base change k. Yeah, yeah. So if we if we think about it here, right? So let's say that x is a sub r. Okay. So it's the generic point. Well, how is the generic point defined, right? So we have this scheme spec r, and spec r since r is a dvr has two points, right? It has the special point and the generic point. Okay. So then the generic fiber is precisely well if you like, base changing by the, the morphism associated to the fraction field of, of R, right? Okay. Be, because, you know, you could, you could see it as, um, let, me, let me write something here. Right. Move, move down and write something. Okay. Right, so, so what's happening? So we have, uh, so we have A sub R, we have R dvr, with back R is K. Okay. So, right, and we said this was X. So then we wanted to say that X eta was just A sub K. So, um, what happens is that, uh, just a second. So, so you can think of the generic fiber in, in several ways, right? So one is to say that, okay, well, spec R some guy like this, and then um, there's a map pi from like this, right? Uh, shoot, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why am I confusing myself here? It's okay, I believe you if you just say x eta is a base change k, that, I mean, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, th 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 there shouldn't be anything complicated happening here. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry about that. I am blanking a little bit, but... That's okay. I, I should I should be able to deduce it later, so maybe maybe we can handle that a little bit later. Okay, cool. So this basically gives us properness. Um, 
And so then what we're left to show is smoothness, right? So I mentioned on, uh, I, I mentioned on, I think Monday, that there's a theorem of Cartier that handles uh, smoothness in characteristic zero. We're talking about like finite type uh, commutative k-group schemes with maybe one other hypothesis reducing this stuff. Uh, but in positive characteristic, things are a little bit messy. So if characteristic of k is positive, so let's see this, then uh, the Picard scheme itself need not be smooth. Which means that we're going to have to work a little bit more closely with the dual itself. So that's what we need to do here. So let's have G be the dimension of A. Then there are a series of steps uh, to show smoothness, right? So smoothness is going to be equivalent to the dimension of a dual is the dimension of the tangent space at the identity of a dual as a k vector space, right? And, and um, the reason why, why this is the case is because, well, um, the dimension should be built up from, you know, local dimensions, right? So you're taking a supremum. Each of those local dimensions if smoothness is satisfied, it should correspond to the tangent space at that point, the dimension of that. And by translation, we know that the dimension at every single point is the same. So what we find is that you really only need to check things at the identity. So basically, we want to show that both numbers on this in this equation <clears throat> are G. Okay. So then the, the steps that we take to deduce that are the following. So we want to show that the dimension of the tangent space of the dual is equal to the k dimension of the first cohomology of the structure sheaf. Okay. Second, we want to show that g is a lower bound for the dimension of the dual, the cold dimension in this case, and that that's bounded by the dimension here. Okay. And the third is to show that the dimension of the first cohomology of the structure sheet is bounded by G. And so if you stick all this together, what you see is that, well, G is less than or equal to the dimension of both things and both things are less than or equal to G. So that means that they're both G. Okay. So um, in order to do this, we need to understand a little something about the tangent space, right? Namely, what we want to say is this, right? Or rather, let me, let me remind you how, how the tangent space works. So if I have a case scheme X and I have a K point, little X, then there's, you know, we, we can basically think of the tangent space at X to X as the following. It is Y in X adjoin K epsilon, and I'll explain myself in a second, such that the following diagram commutes. So what's the diagram C of Y? Well, C of Y should be thought of as, as this guy. So I have spec of K, I have spec of k joint epsilon, and I have x.
Okay, so here we want a commutative diagram like this, where k adjoint epsilon is, well, basically it's a k algebra with epsilon squared is zero. And um, the map that we're defining is induced by the map that is k adjoint epsilon to k given by epsilon maps to zero, right? So the tangent space is about infinitesimal lifts. And we think about this guy epsilon is sort of encoding the data of a tangent vector on x. So that's why it is no potent of, uh, I guess, no potency order two. Not sure if that's the right notation, but um, OK. So quick, quick reminder about how that works. And so then, um, oh, again, where, where x of k epsilon is just, I'm base changing. Uh, sorry, k, k epsilon here is, is just shorthand for spec k epsilon. Hopefully that's, that's clear. OK, cool. So um, what we can say is this, that the tangent space of the dual is well, first of all, it's the tangent space at the entirety of the Picard scheme, because again, this was the connected component of the identity. So since all this is locally defined, it, it doesn't matter if we pass to the entire Picard scheme in this case. Um, and this is isomorphic to the kernel of the Picard group, sorry, the Picard scheme, it's k epsilon points mapping to the k points of the Picard scheme, right? That's exactly what this, this above diagram says, where this guy is c of y. Okay. Um, Zachary, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the definition of the a dual now. Like, what, what is that the connected component of the zero? Mm -hmm. okay, it's yeah. Then, then how can a dual be smooth and not Picard of a while k be smooth? How can it be that? Um, I mean, it just looks like copies of that, right? I don't think that's exactly true because it has because of the scheme structure that's placed on it. Um, let me let me think for a second. And yeah, I mean, because if the tangent space are the same, then they don't have any different reduce non reducing structure either. Yeah, give me a second. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. I think, hold on. I, I do seem to remember there being, being some obstruction happening away from the identity. But I mean, like, but doesn't doesn't your should look the same? Maybe maybe the point is we're looking with k groups and not k bar. So not or is that a, like a subtlety here? I think I think that is important. I'm I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Okay. Anyway, yeah, yeah. It seems like we yeah we define the g zero part. That's some there is some non-trivial thing. 
about it than just a connected component. But anyway, yeah. Thanks. Well, I mean, let me, you know, yeah, I won't say. I mean, what I what I know about the G naught is that it's it sits inside of G as a closed subscheme, and the map that takes it in there is a flat closed embedding. Yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I'll I'll have to I'll have to look back and and see. Um, yeah, sorry. No, no worries. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So yeah, so maybe maybe um, in the interest of time, I won't go into all the details on this result, and then I will I will attempt to also give a counterexample um, and positive characteristic. Maybe I'll link that in the um, in the Slack. Uh, but really, what what you want to do here for this first step? Because we're we're pursuing the first step right here, right? Where we're trying to show that these two things coincide is we're going to try to relate well we need to relate the um the cohomology of of the structure sheaf of a with the dimension here so what we do is we identify that dimension with the uh with the dimension of a particular kernel of, of maps like this and then um we note for ourselves that uh, what's the best? What's the best way to say this? Well, sure. Okay. So these things are going to look like it, this guy, especially on the right, is going to look like the actual Picard group of A. This is just the Picard group of A, right? Essentially, and. Um, this guy here is basically the Picard group of not A, but A like infinitesimally deformed or whatever. Uh, so then what we can say for ourselves is, okay, well, the Picard groups, these are first cohomology groups, right? So you can imagine that you want to write down some kind of short exact sequence, like an exponential short exact sequence. Um, that, you know, has these as appearing as first cohomology groups and then you have the uh, the first cohomology groups of of, of OA. Um, so what what is that short exact sequence? Let me just give it to you here. Um, you, you can build it in two steps if you like. So one way to think about it is that you have one plus uh, epsilon O. A epsilon mapping to O A epsilon cross mapping to O A cross mapping to one. And then you can conveniently identify this as, well, this guy here, you can identify as O A via taking something like one plus epsilon sigma to sigma. So then this becomes a, a sort of, I guess, poor man's short exact like exponential sequence. Um, and then you, you just run the cohomology argument on that. Right, you look at the, you look at the long, uh, the induced long exact sequence with respect to this guy. So this is an SES. Okay. So yeah, maybe, Maybe leaving that for now as, as how one works. How about two? So, so I'll say you know, this gives one. So then for two, what we can say is that, well, we know A is projective. And so it has an ample line bundle. L. Okay, and then 
A result that, that will follow from stuff we do later today is that the associated phi L, which we know maps A to A dual, is finite. Um, and so what that implies via um, an argument that I, I won't lay out here, but ask me about it later, is that G is a lower bound for the dimension of A dual. Okay. And so then we get two because remember what we wanted to show. So we, we deduce the first half and then the second half is actually immediate, right? This is always going to be a lower bound for this and then they coincide precisely in the case that you have, um, I guess, regularity or well, uh, yeah, in, in our case, they coincide. Um, or, or wait, hold on, what am I saying? Sorry, they don't coincide. We just have a less than equal to always. Okay, we want to deduce that they coincide. Okay, so what about for three? Well, three, I'm not going to fully show. Sorry, I'm trying not to try this left and right. Okay. So, so we get two since the second half is automatic. Okay, and then uh, for three, you know, you should check the notes uh, for, for a more careful proof, but the basic idea is that um, you use a structure theorem for Hopf algebras to show that um, the map from the ith exterior power of H1 of the structure sheaf mapping to the ith cohomology of A, you know, which is induced by cut product is an isomorphism for every choice of I. And uh, what, what this says, right, because remember what we want to show, excuse my mouse, make it easier. We want to show that G was an upper bound here. And yeah, it's okay. Hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we want to show that the G is an upper bound for the dimension of, of H1. And so then what we can say is that um, you, you need to basically use uh, some duality results to relate information about H1 to other cohomology groups. So I, I don't, I don't want to unpack that here um, just in the interest of time, but if you have questions like after we conclude, then I'll, I'll stick around and we can talk then. But I think what I'm going to do, since this is a, a good stopping place for now, uh, is do like a five minute break. Again, you can ask me questions and stuff and then we will resume at 11.05. Hey, unpause it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I just want to clarify for the recording um, something that, that we just cleared up. So. Yeah, I misspoke earlier. It turns out that um, the Picard scheme is smooth in positive characteristic for abelian varieties, and that's exactly what the argument shows. Uh, it's just that the Picard scheme can be defined more generally, and in those cases, there are reduced misconcerns concerns that pop up. Okay, so with that said, um, let's get to it again. So, all right. Let me scroll down. Or, I guess I have to pan down. <laughs> All right, so from here we move to our next topic and our last topic for today, which I will simply give the, to uh, the title of isogeny and torsion, if I can spell. <laughs> Maybe I can't. Okay.
Cool. So, um, you know, whenever you're doing something in mathematics, whenever you work in a new field, then it's important to know when the objects you're studying are equivalent. And for abelian varieties, the notion of equivalence that we care about is isogeny. So with that definition, so this could be stated just the same for abelian schemes, and it will pop up in that context, but we'll just say it for abelian varieties. Um, so an isogeny is a finite, flat, surjective morphism of abelian varieties. So in particular, it's a morphism of the underlying group schemes. Okay. Um, you know, the, the phrase isogenous means there exists an isogeny between, so I, I won't write that down. Um, but if F A to B is an isogeny, it has a degree which is degree of F, and this is just, oh, that worked out, uh, the degree of the extension of function fields. So we have the function field of A, that's extending the function field of B, we measure the degree of that extension. Okay. So, first of all, it would seem from, you know, the notion here, right, so if we were to say that two abelian varieties are isogenous and we want to be a notion of equivalence, then it ought to be an equivalence relation. That is true. Um, it's maybe not immediately apparent from what we're doing here, and, you know, that's true, but we'll get to that. Um, so, right, so we have this notion of isogeny. What about some examples, right? So let me just give you a classic example. And this, this, is, um, this is one case of where if you study the theory of elliptic curves and you don't know about anything else, then you might get the wrong idea. Because if I have A and B both be elliptic curves, well, and I have F A to B is, you know, a morphism of, of the curves uh, that's non-zero. Non-zero. Oh my goodness. Then F is an isogeny. You know. And I guess the more the more general result here, right, is that if you have a morphism between projective curves, so here they're elliptic, so they're projective, um, then this map's either constant or it's surjective. And so, you know, the, the constancy of this map, well, the only constant value you could have as a morphism of abelian varieties is uh, if it's zero, but it's non-zero, so it's surjective, and then uh, the other properties sort of come along for free. Okay, and this sort of thing does not have to happen, so this, does not have to happen. Oh, shoot. If dimension A and dimension B are bigger than one. Okay. So I won't give a counterexample. I invite you to actually construct your own. Um, I think it's fun. Okay. But what we can say is this, right? If we want to understand what isogeny looks like, well, in this case, right, A and B had the same dimension, dimension one, and that's not an accident, right? So let's have A to B be a morphism of abelian varieties. Okay, so then there are a couple of things we can say, right? So the first one is if F is flat, 
then in fact, F is subjective. Shoot, I it like that, okay. Conversely, if F is surjective, then in fact, F is flat. Third, um, if F is finite and surjective, then uh, the dimensions are the same. Finally, um, <laughs> if the dimensions are the same, sorry about that. Then um, F is flat if it's finite. Okay, so what's going on here? So <clears throat> morphisms of abelian varieties already have a lot of structure. You know, we saw uh, in the first lecture that it sufficed for, you know, if you have a morphism of If you just have a k-morphism of abelian varieties and it maps the identity to the identity, then it has to be a morphism of, of the underlying group schemes. So that's already a pretty strong result. Moreover, um, we saw then that this map is automatically proper. And these sorts of rigidity constraints and, and high structure conditions on F make it so that a lot of conditions we would want to demand from the map end up being equivalent or in, you know, in collection, they end up being redundant, one of the conditions, right? So what this lemma tells us is that, you know, when we said it was finite, flat, surjective, then basically, um, you know, either the flat or subject, the flatness of the surjectivity was sort of superfluous. Um, and that if we make dimensional constraints, then in fact, we can eliminate sort of one of the bunch and, and not miss anything. Uh, so that's sort of an, an interesting thing, and it makes it so that if you want to check a map is an isogeny, then you don't need to do as much work as you would think you needed to at the beginning. Uh, I think, though, that in the interest of time, I will leave the proof of this uh, to, well, I, I think I will leave that to your own discretion. Uh, it's mostly a technical result. It, it rests on a couple of different conditions that uh, characterize flatness. So there's something called the miracle flatness theorem. And then uh, the first result, sorry, the second result, B here, makes use of uh, growth induced generic flatness. But yeah, the, the proof here is mostly technical, nothing all that complicated, but I don't think it's terribly enlightening. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, to leave that to you. Um, so yeah, okay. But this is an important step on the way of understanding what isogenies look like. Okay, so then closely connected to the story of isogeny is the story of torsion. So let me get to that. Okay. So how do we define torsion, right? Well, there, there are two ways, or rather, there, there are um, two different things, both called torsion, right? Uh, if I have M and Z and I have, let's say, gamma in a Belian group, like so, then we get gamma bracket M. It's M torsion, which is, you know, stuff killed by multiplication by M, which we could define in, yeah, there's an action of, of Z on, on gamma, and so then stuff killed by M is the torsion. So it is, shoot, the M torsion. Cool. Similarly, if M is in Z and I have A, my abelian variety, then there is a torsion subscheme. And, you know, just to remind you guys, this is a, a, a kernel 
right? And how was it obtained? Well, it was obtained by thinking of Oh yeah, yeah. So this is the identity map, right? This is M, and then this is a pullback. So this is how you actually obtain it. Uh, so in particular, properties of the multiplication map will transfer over to properties of the structure morphism of uh, the M torsion, and in particular, that that tells you about the structure of the M torsion as a case scheme. Okay. Cool. So that means that already we have a reason to study the M torsion, um, but also note that you know we mentioned the mortal Vey theorem on the first day, and we, we said that we wanted to talk about the K points mod the action of M, right? Or yeah, we want to look at this. And well, if you think about it, this sits in a short exact sequence that also involves M torsion of the K points. So it's going to be important that we understand something about this morphism, the multiplication by M morphism. OK, cool. So with that said, what are we going to do? Well, um, here's something powerful we can say about the M torsion. It's a theorem. Uh, and we will need this for abelian schemes, not just abelian varieties. So A over S be an abelian scheme. OK, and let's have m be a non-zero integer. So just say that. Then the multiplication map, m, which takes a to a, is an isogeny. And uh, if m is an S unit, right? What does that mean? That means that M is in OS cross. Well, sorry, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It's an OS of S cross. Then uh, M is not just an isogeny, it's a tall. Okay. So what's the proof? Again, please interrupt me at any point if you have questions. OK, so so sorry, when, when I say M is an S unit, maybe I should say it's invertible in S, because in number theory, the notion of S unit means something different. And it will, we'll actually use that next, next time. So maybe invertible in S is a better way to say this. But yeah, let's handle the second case first. So maybe, maybe this will be like 1. And this is two being a little, a little, a little sloppy and informal here, but let's handle two first. Okay, so we want to show that m multiplication by m is an an atoll isogeny, right? Sort of killing two birds with one stone, if you will. Uh, but really, we only need to know that m is atoll. So. Only need to show. M is a tall. Why? Well, first of all, because surjectivity comes along for the ride. I mean, basically, all, all the other properties come along for the ride. So, um, oh gosh, what do I want to say here? I mean, first and foremost, M is automatically flat. OK, and the dimension of both guys here is the same, right? So by our lemma, flatness gives us surjectivity. And if we have, yeah, since we have echodimensionality, then we also get finiteness. So the isogeny thing comes for free. Although atoll morphisms are very nicely behaved in general, we don't necessarily need to appeal to the lemma um, all the way. but that's just easy. So, so that implies automatically for us that M is an isogeny. Okay, 
So then how do we show it's a tall, right? Well, um, what, what we want to do, um, hold on a second, sorry, thinking for a second here. Okay, I, I guess I misspoke slightly, right? So the previous result holds for, um, holds for a billion varieties, and here we're working with an arbitrary base. Uh, technically, you need to first do things fiber-wise and know that the various conditions you want to check hold fiber-wise, and then you can appeal to the previous result and nothing is lost. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid that for now. Right, so how do we show that, that our map is a tall? Well, recall that the sort of the geometric idea behind being um, a tall is that you are, you're sort of a local diffeomorphism, right? Or you want to be sort of like a... Um, yeah, yeah, it should, it should be like a local diffeomorphism. And so um, one way to think about that is that it behaves nicely with tangent vectors, and that can be made precise. So let me do that. So uh, M is a tall at some point X in A if and only if what? Well, uh, let's see. Right. So there are two ways to state this, right? So one is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. If you look at the map on the level of, um, I guess, cotangent sheaves or cotangent spaces, really, we don't need to. Working over a single point, over k, spec k. Okay. Uh, this natural map needs to induce an isomorphism on stocks at x. Right, but we can dualize this statement into a more familiar statement about. Um, tangent vectors. So in particular, we want dm, which you should think of as the, the differential of the map m, so the natural map induced on tangent spaces, which takes, uh, so we have the tangent space at a with respect to k at x, and it takes it to the tangent space of a with respect to k, but now at the point mx, and we want this to be an isomorphism of k vector spaces. Okay, so it, you know, it uniquely lifts tangent vectors, if you will, from, from here to there. Okay, cool. So um, you can first show that dm, and this is just a, a simple application of functoriality, if you like. dm is multiplication by m. Uh, hence, it's an isomorphism if and only if M is a unit in K, or rather it's, it's image in K, if you will, right? M times the identity element. Um, but we know the latter, right? So basically, um, this implies for us that Say so, dm is an isomorphism, which is good because we get a diagram like this, right? So, you have your sort of Lie algebra tangent space of the identity. Once again, your tangent space of the identity, and then tangent space of x, and the tangent space at the image of x. So then. How do we move between things? Well, here, nothing special, right? This is dm. That's dm. This is given by differentiating the translation map. And similarly, this is given by translating, I mean, differentiating the appropriate translation map. OK? So this guy commutes. No surprises, again, because this is just multiplication by M. And these guys are uh, you know, morphisms of group schemes. And so um, everything checks out. 
Okay. So then, well, these guys are isomorphisms. They're invertible. And so what that tells you, or sorry, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself one more time. Right, what do we want to show? Um, shoot, just a second. Confusing myself. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. So, so we know that um, the multiplication by M map on, I guess, basically the Lie algebra, this is very easy to describe. It's multiplication by M. And we know it's an isomorphism because M is a unit in K. Okay. And so then we want to look at a more general DM. But what we say to ourselves is, well, really, DM is an isomorphism. And these translation maps give rise to isomorphisms of tangent spaces too. So it's a composition of isomorphisms. So it's an isomorphism. And we get that this map is a tall. Okay. Yeah, Zach, like, why is that multiplication, multiplication by M? Why is it multiplication by M? So what you do is, is um, I guess this is really more of a result about commutative group schemes in general. But um, on, a, on a general commutative group scheme, right, you have addition. And let me think. Yeah, let me do this in red. So we have, uh, I'm just going to use A, right? So we have A cross A mapping to A by plus. OK, and what do we want to do? Well, we want to look at simultaneously. So we have the tangent space at, we'll say, like 0, 0. A cross A, and we have the tangent space at zero of A crossed with the tangent space at zero of A, uh, and then we have the tangent space at zero A. Okay, so there is a mm. isomorphism like this, right? Yeah. And then the map that goes down here, this is like D plus for some terrible notation, right? Yep. And this map. Well, there, there are some ways we could write this map, but I'm just going to say that this map is plus, right? So really, you want to show this commutes. And if you do, then induction gives you what you want, right? Yeah. OK. So to show that this guy commutes, um, what we want to do is look at the image of pairs A0 and pairs 0B. Uh, let me think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Because because zero is just identity. So that maps yes. to A. Yes. So then so then the fact that um the fact that the morphism you have, like basically everything can be written as a sum of guys like this, and you you're sort of forced to send these things to the the expected thing because this is the identity. Um right. Yeah, I mean that that's a little rough, but that's that's really all that happens. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. So there's something that, hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, the proof makes a lot of sense, and it seems like you can work for arbitrary group scheme, like where this commutivity shows. Which I, I'm assuming that you better oh, have commutivity. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um. Well, okay. So commutativity. Um. C commutativity here shouldn't shouldn't matter. I don't think. Okay. So this is just. I mean, it seems like you host in general. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. You, you don't need commutativity. I, the reason why my brain jumped to commutativity is because we're doing repeated addition. And I was just, my brain was like, bookkeeping will be easier if it's, if it's commutative. But it doesn't. Oh, I see. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, cool. thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right. So this, this gives us the Atal case. All right. So maybe, maybe I will uh, erase this. Uh, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just scroll down. So that's, that's what happens if we're at all, right? What if we're not at all? So what if all we know is, well, sorry, what if we don't know anything about invertibility? Well, we still want to know we're in isogeny, right? So again, uh, we note 
that flatness, uh, surjectivity, and finiteness can all be checked fiber-wise. So we may assume a loss of generality that S is spec K. OK? So then, um, as we know, because of equidimensionality, uh, it suffices to show that uh, M is finite. But, um, okay, let's see here. Let me think, think for a second. Yeah, this is fine. We want to show it's fine. Okay, so then um, what can we do? Well, to say choose L, ample line bundle on A, Again, we know that A is projective, so we can do this. All right. And what do we want to do with it? Well, define M to be L tensored with the minus one pullback of L. Yes. Uh, this is an example of a symmetric line bundle, which means that uh, the minus one pullback of M is isomorphic to M. It's just a, a small notational thing, or it's, it's a convention that you should know. So this guy's symmetric. Uh, and he's ample, right? Because L is ample, and minus one is just an automorphism, right? Your multiplication by minus one is an automorphism. So pulling back by that should preserve ampleness, really, since, since L is ample. It's the key here. OK. Uh, and so then what we can say, so, so uh, say by the lemma below, which, we, which is a computation that, that we will do here in a second, uh, we can look at the pullback by multiplication of our big M guy. And we can write down explicitly what it is. So it's given by. Um, should be m squared plus m divided by two. So that tensor power of m, then tensored up with the minus one pullback of m, tensored up to m squared minus m over two. OK? And in our case, because we chose m to be symmetric, and this is one reason why we choose it symmetric is because we know that we have an, a formula like this. And so then we want to relate minus one pullback M with M. Uh, this is just M tensor, uh, let's see here, M squared, right? I think I did the math right there. Okay, cool. So, oh, ah, there's my cursor, uh, which is ample, right? And it's ample because M is ample. But but what? Well, if we look at the pullback of M and we restrict it to the M torsion. Then, of course, we can switch the order of the pullback and the restriction, right? So this will be the M pullback of M restricted to AM. And that's got to be trivial. Because this is the kernel of M, multiplication by M. So what does this say, right? 
well, if we restrict this guy to AM as well, then we're saying that this ample thing restricted to a to the M torsion is ample, right? So, so what this implies is that the structure sheaf of the M torsion is ample, um, and by uh, what is it? Sarah's van like Sarah has criteria on ampleness and also on affineness, which involve cohomology and so on. Uh, what this implies for us is that AM is affine, right? And since A bracket M is since the M torsion is affine, all of its closed subschemes will be affine too, because you know this is some spec R. Every closed subscheme is spec of R, you know, mod I for some ideal I. Um, and so, a lot of so's here, A bracket M has dimension zero. Uh, the reason why it has to have dimension zero is because if it didn't, then it would contain a proper closed K curve. And that proper closed K curve would have to be non-affine, right? But that can't be the case because, well, if it's a proper closed K-curve inside, it'd have to be affine according to this. Okay, that's not the right button. Right, so that means that, that this thing has dimension zero. Why does that matter? Well, what this says is that, um, Multiplication by M has finite fibers, right? Because this is the stuff corresponding to what happens at the identity of A. Um, so this thing being dimension zero, because this guy is quasi finite, that corresponds to finiteness of this group scheme. And by translation, finiteness here corresponds to finite fibers. And since M is proper, as we mentioned a while back, and again, um, I can walk you through the proof of that if you're interested, but M's proper, so that means that being finite is equivalent to being uh, having finite fibers. So since M is proper, M is finite. And that gives us the result we were looking for. Okay, so before, before I move on to maybe uh, the final thing of today, or the last two things of today, then I want to ask, are there any questions? OK, cool. So right. Let me just briefly recap, since uh, we've done a lot of stuff and, and we've been at it for a while, even though we took a break. So we showed that, let me just grab my mouse. All right. <clears throat> so we showed that for the case of a general abelian scheme, our multiplication map is going to be an isogeny, and it will be a tall under some nice conditions, namely assuming that M is invertible um, in S, right? So why does this matter? Well, this matters because, one, it's going to be a starting point for using a tall cohomology to prove weak Mordell Bay, which is what we'll do tomorrow. Um, but it's also important because it tells us something about the structure of isogenies more generally, and it allows us to understand isogenies as an equivalence relation, right? Um, so that's, that's something that, that I will spell out here in a second. Uh, but before I do that, I, I have to patch the hole in this proof, or, or rather I have to, um, <clears throat> I, I have to remedy the, the lemma that I mentioned. So what, what was the lemma? So the lemma, was that if I have an L and I have an M and Z, so I guess this should be a line bundle over A, then the pullback of L was what? Well, it was, um, This tensored with minus one pullback of L 
and then tensored up to m squared minus m over 2, right? So what's the proof? Well, the proof here is really uh, a corollary of the theorem of the square, right? Because the theorem of the square told us what happened if we, uh, so, Talks about this guy, if you remember him. L of A1, A2, A3, where these were all T points or, or K points, depending on how you want to do it. So here we probably take them to be um, K points. And then this was, you know, that big long construction, which was like uh, A1 plus A2 plus A3, pull back L tensor to This big guy, that's what that was, right? Told us about its structure, uh, namely that it was trivial. And so then what you want to do here is basically an inductive argument. And I, I won't walk you through the full proof, but basically the base case is, if you like, m equals 0 and 1. And this is hopefully clear if you think about it. 0, there's really nothing to check. And 1, there's also really nothing to check. Um, so then. Uh, what do you want to do here? Well, you take a1 to be m plus 1. You take a2 to be uh, 1, right, which is the identity. And you take a3 to be minus 1, which is negative identity. And then uh, essentially, you, you uh, you induct up and down to show the result for every m. And so you, you need to check m equals 0 and m equals 1 because you're kind of checking on triples, if you will. Uh, but yeah, it's just a fun little inductive argument where you sort of walk up and down. Uh, so I won't, I won't go through that because I don't think it's terribly enlightening, and I, I think it's a fun little exercise to do for yourself. Um, OK. But that's, that's the gist there. So what about the last thing? So let me, let me get to the last point I want to say for today. And then, then we'll stop. OK. And it's sort of what I've been promising. So we want a, I guess in some sense, a, a good description of isogeny. In particular, we want something that makes it clear that isogeny is an equivalence relation. So maybe good here should be in quotes. OK. So let me give you a theorem. And the exercises will lay out uh, parts of the proof that I'll skip. So please check the notes if you're curious about this. Uh, so let's have f from a to b be a uh, morphism of abelian k varieties. OK, so here's the claim. F is an isogeny if and only if there is a G mapping B to A that is an isogeny and a D, which we'll say is a uh, non zero integer, such that. G compose F, my apologies for being F, is multiplication by D on A, right? Because F takes, F starts in A, so this should be a map from A to A. Um, and in either case, the composition in the opposite direction, so F compose G, is multiplication by D on B, OK? So what does this theorem tell us? Well, um, first of all, it tells us that isogeny is an equivalence relation, right? Because this is clearly a symmetric condition, the second one. Um, the second part is that it says that not only is multiplication by uh, you know, some integer on an abelian variety in isogeny, but it is 
sort of a prototypical example of an isogeny. And in some extent, it's, or sorry, to some extent, all isogenies are sort of, they, they correspond to those kinds of things. They have a complement, if you will, this G that, that corresponds to that. Okay. So how do we prove this? Well, basically, let's handle the, the uh, forward direction first, right? So we know that F is an isogeny, right? And the D that we want to look at is the degree of F. And we know that this is not zero, right? Because it's at least one. Hold on. Okay. Because F is an isogeny, the kernel of F, kernel of F is a, finite group scheme. Uh, oh. You know, with, with rank D. And so it's annihilated by multiplication by D. And this is something that, that you have to check. But it, it's true. OK. So something else that you have to check is that there's a factorization So I'll say, here we have A, and here we have B, and A. So this is F. This is G. That's multiplication by D. OK. So then you just have to check that, uh, that G is an isogeny. Right? So we know from this, so, so say with uh, G from B to A, a morphism of abelian varieties. Okay, cool. So it suffices to check, or, or rather all that's left now is to check that G is an isogeny. And this is not very surprising, right? Because if you look here, multiplication by D is an isogeny. It's surjective. Well, if, if this guy's surjective, then the map G is surjective. So we can say that G is, uh, <laughs> can't draw for the life of me. G is surjective, all right, and uh, let's see. Moreover, what we can say is that G composed multiplication by D on B is, well, multiplication by D on A composed with G. This is just the fact that G is a morphism of Billing varieties. Okay. But then this is G compose F compose G, and that's G compose F compose G. Okay, I, I, sorry, getting ahead of myself, right? So, uh, what what I've what I've secretly appealed here to or appealed to here is that G being surjective implied by the lemma that we talked about before that G is an isogeny, because since F is an isogeny. It gives equidimensionality of A and B, and um, the other two conditions come for free. So sorry, I, I that was a little sloppy of me. I, I apologize. Uh, so then, to show that in this case we have the factorization uh, in the opposite direction, so the composition in the other direction is also multiplication by D. What you do is you you compose up like this, and then uh, you prove a sort of uniqueness result, which allows you to cancel off. So then this tells you that uh, db is in fact given by the composition like this. And then for the converse, right, if we know that 
G is an isogeny. Uh, uh, what do I want to say here? Right, so, so for the converse direction, everything is basically the same, right? You can once again use this computation here that I just did to deduce that the, the uh, composition in the multi opposite direction is multiplication. And then knowing that G is an isogeny, you deduce equidimensionality and you use that uh, DB is an isogeny to say that F is surjective and then we say that F is an isogeny. So sort of true to form, since this is about a, uh, you know, isogeny being equivalence relation, then the argument itself is, is symmetric. Uh, so I, I know I said that a little bit fast, but that's the gist of how it works. And uh, yeah, so I think I will leave the theory there for today because we've talked enough. Um, and tomorrow we'll talk about the weak mortal bay theorem. So uh, yeah, if you have any questions, then I'm here. Ask me. <laughs>